It's always a pleasure to be in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, this is my, I don't know, fourth, fifth, sixth time. I can't, I can't keep track anymore. Western civilization. So, you know, we live in, in pretty amazing times. We are unbelievably rich as compared to our ancestors. We have available to us amazing technologies. You know, everybody, I always use my iPhone in my lectures because it's such an amazing uh, tool. But this is very symbolic of the kind of life that we have and the kind of stuff we take for granted in the West. Because what is this? What is this? What does it do? It's a communication device, right? We call it a phone. But it's much more than a phone, right? You can video conference with people, multiple people, all at the same time, via video from anywhere in the world. I mean, I travel all over the world and I can video conference with my kids, say goodnight to them. I mean, it's truly stunning. Now, your generation grew up with this. I, I remember when we had to when there was no cell phones, never mind no iPhones. And this is young, this is just about 10, 11 years old. But it's not just a communication device. What, is, what else is it? Uh, first of all, it's, it's an idea. Well, sure, it's an idea, but what does it do? What else does it do? It gives us information. It gives us information. A little bit of information? We can express ourselves on this phone, right? We can take pictures, we can take videos, so it's a camera. It's not just a camera, it's a video camera. And it's a video streaming device, right? We can stream our stuff anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, anywhere. It's information. How much information? Pretty much all the information available in all of human civilization ever, all of it is at our fingertips. Forget the printing press, it's all here, whenever you want it, at a cost of what? What's the cost? Zero, marginal cost of zero. We have, this is an entertainment device. Every piece of music ever written and recorded in all of history is available here at a marginal cost of zero. This is a more powerful computer in terms of computing power than the computer that sent man to the moon. More powerful than mainframe computers that used to fill up a whole room like this. I still remember those. I, was, I think I was the last class in my university that programmed with punch cards. You used to punch the zeros and the ones into a card and feed it into a machine, go home, come back the next day and get the results after the machine. And basically you were doing two plus two equals four and it would take it all night and it would give you hopefully the right answer. I mean, that's not that long ago. I mean, maybe it is for you, but not for me. It seems like yesterday, 30 years. So we have at our disposal the most powerful tool known to mankind. It's a communication device. It's a computer. It's a computation device. It's an entertainment center. And it gives us access to every piece of information known to man. I mean, in many respects, the iPhone is a symbol of Western civilization. Because what does it reflect? What does it reflect? What makes the iPhone possible? What makes the iPhone possible? Freedom. freedom. The freedom to do what? Uh, Freedom's a nice word. Everybody loves freedom, including the Marxists, including the fascists. Everybody claims to like freedom. Free market. Well, free market, but again, free market means what? 
What do, what do people actually do in a free market? What's that? It's, it's a product of wealth. We need it to accumulate capital in order to build it. We need to have free markets, which is free what? So it's individual freedom to do what? I'm not going to let you get away with just one word answers that are, that are floating abstractions. What does it actually mean? Of what? Expression, so the freedom to express yourself. And how does that manifest in an iPhone? Well, both on the content side, but even in the creation of the, of the iPhone, right? Trade. There's an idea here. What's that? Trade. The freedom to trade, the freedom to exchange. And what's behind all these freedoms? Expression, trade, manifest ourselves as individuals. Freedom of choice. Freedom to choose, make our own choices. And what's behind that? What's that? They're all a right? Sorry, what did you say? Yes, right. And all of them behind is the right. Yeah, all of this behind it is, is the right to do all these things. Values. What's that? Values. values. Yeah, I mean, all of these are values, but we have the right to choose our own values and to pursue our own values. That's part of what freedom is, right? It's the ability to choose and pursue our own values. But behind it all, is this idea that we have the capacity and the freedom to think for ourselves. Now that's new. This idea that each one of us has a tool that allows us to discover truth, to know the world. And we each have a right to think whatever we want to think and then express those thoughts in action, free trade, free movement, free markets, and in thought, free expression, free creativity. But at the root of all of that is an idea that comes out of the early 18th century, a long time ago. But the beginning, in my view, of the real Western civilization as we know. What was life like before the 18th century? All over the West, all over the world. What's that? Monarchy. But what was life as an individual like? Poor. Short, poor, short. Oppression. Oppressed, barbaric. We were serfs. They were aristocrats. We were serfs, no freedom. No freedom of expression, no freedom of movement, no freedom to, to act. And what was, what was the consequence in terms of wealth? How wealthy were we? Industrialization. Well, it's just before industrialization. How wealthy were we? Uh, wealthy is like not the word we should use. Like, we were too much. We, we had nothing. Like, we had nothing. Even our lives did not belong to us. We had nothing. Even the aristocrats, as compared to anybody in this room, had nothing. Not only had nothing, but we were nothing. We were nothing. We were considered nothing. So for 100,000 years, or for whatever, however you want to go backwards in terms of human history, we were basically nothing. We had nothing. If you look at the statistics, right, basically all of us owned about $2 a day. We couldn't accumulate any wealth because what did we do with, the, with whatever money we had? We needed it to eat. We grew, we grew our food and we ate it. We got up, when the sun rose, we went to sleep when the sun set. We couldn't read a book because we couldn't read. We couldn't read a book because there was no light at night. And during the day we worked or we died. Those were the alternatives, you worked or you died. I mean, people have this romantic view of man, of, I don't know, man in a cave, or man a long time ago in the village. Or, it was horrible. What was life expectancy? 30. 30. In, at, at, in the West, it, it, you know, it reached in, uh, in the early, in the, in the late 18th century, it reached 39. 39. You guys are all middle-aged. I'm dead a long time ago. Yeah, 
Yes, they were hoping for heaven, right? Good luck with that. So life from all of human history until about 300 years ago, life was awful. Short, brutish, and boring. Boring is good, yeah, very boring. Very boring, no iPhones, no music, no Netflix, boring, right? And no job that you liked. You, you, you were born into your job, right? Most of us were farmers, but if you lived in a city, what was your job? Who chose your job for you? Parents. Your parents. Whatever your father did, you did if you were a man, and if you were a woman, forget about it. There's no job. Your job is to have kids. And most of the kids die. Most of the kids die. Over 50% of children died before the age of 10. And a significant percentage of women died at childbirth. So most of you didn't even survive to see your children. And you certainly had no careers. Right? There was no, you had no property, you had no rights. And then something amazing happened. If you look at, at the graph of uh, income or wealth, it's kind of flat for 100,000 years. It goes up a little bit. People are a little bit better off in Greece. They're a little bit better off in Rome. And then you get the Dark Ages and they go back down. And it stays down. And then it starts going up a little bit during the Renaissance. But it's really all small movements. And then suddenly, suddenly it goes like that. And you have to jump to reach because you can't even measure how high it goes. Because how do you measure the value of running water and flushing toilets? How do you measure the value of electricity? I mean, as economists, we can measure the amount of money we pay for it or the amount of money we invest in the assets. But we can't measure the utility it provides human beings. We can't measure the quality of life that is improved as a consequence of having electricity, having running water, having high rises, having universities, having schools, our quality of life today is millions of times better than it was 300 years ago. In terms of money, it's hundreds of times better. But in terms of actual quality of life, the fact that we can live into our 80s today, your generation might live, it's probably gonna live into their 90s. And you know, if, if with a little bit of medical innovation, maybe well into your hundreds. So what happened that made it possible for us to have this massive spike in a very short period? Remember, 100,000 years, nothing. Agriculture, another 10,000 years, nothing. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, bam. No, French Revolution killed a bunch of people, guillotine people. How much progress do we get from slaughtering people? That's industrial revolution and afterwards technology. Yeah, and the industrial revolution and technology, but what caused the industrial revolution? Why did the industrial revolution happen when it happened? And why did it happen where it happened? Why didn't it happen in China? Because of freedom. Because of freedom, but where did freedom come from? How did we get freedom? Accident? It just happened? We just wanted it, so we took it, right? Everywhere waiting for centuries. Centuries waiting for freedom. Do people wait in freedom? Do we really want freedom? Is it something we're born with and we just can't wait to become free? I mean, I wish, because there's still a lot of people in the world who are not free and they seem to be just sitting around waiting for it to happen. So basically, I think that all of It all happens simultaneously. Yeah. But what is the core of the ideas? And I don't think it happens simultaneously. It actually happens progressively. It happens over time. You can start seeing, if you look back in history, you can start seeing the signs of what is leading up to a massive breakthrough. But what is it that makes it all possible? Well, it's ideas. So the first really, really important point is that ideas shape history. Ideas make freedom possible. 
ideas make it possible for us to live the kind of life we have today. And what are the idea, what's the most important idea that I think was discovered, articulated, taught, preached in the 18th century that made this possible? American Constitution. American Constitution is the culmination. It's like the end. It's like the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But that's like where we get to. But this idea makes the Constitution possible. Well, this idea is an idea that comes out of the Renaissance into kind of the early 18th century, 1700s. And it's an idea that the Greeks understood, but didn't take it all the way. It's the idea that what makes it possible for human beings to survive? What is the tool that makes it possible for us to survive, to exist, to thrive, to do well? What makes it possible for us to do well? As a species, as human beings, what makes it, what, in what way are we different than every other animal out there? Uh, communication and... Even before communication. You need this in order to communicate. Society, reason. Uh, uh, chimpanzees have societies. Reason. You have to be able to think. What is reason? Ability to observe reality integrate the information of reality, to abstract it, to use logic to discover truth. That only we can do. No other animal can do that. No other animal can abstract from the concretes of reality. No other animal can then explain its reality and then actually change its environment to fit it. We've been doing this since the beginning of time. How do we survive as human beings? Evolution. What's that? Evolution. Evolution? Evolution created us. We're a product of evolution. But how do we survive? I mean, the difference between us... Because we, we have ego, and we by, 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 by ego, evolution made us rational beings. Evolution made us rational beings. But evolution, because it made us rational beings, did not give us the code on how to survive. Our genes don't tell us how to hunt. Our genes don't tell us how to do agriculture. You don't know how to hunt genetically, instinctually. And certainly we don't know how to do agriculture. It took us 90,000 years or maybe 100,000 years to discover agriculture. So. Evolution created something very unique in human beings. It gave us the capacity to reason. It gave us the capacity to choose, which means it gave us the capacity to think. So in order for us to get food, we have to figure out how to get food. We have to we have to imagine, but more than that, we have to look at the animals out there and figure out how to catch them. I mean, look at us. We're pathetic animals. We're weak, we're slow, we have no claws, we have no fangs, big teeth. So I mean, try running down a bison and biting into it. Uh, so you mean we need to have vision about what to do, how to do, and uh, by the way, we were at, uh, So in order to communicate, you have to have concepts. In order to have vision, vision is like a fuzzy word. What we really need is to think. So we have to have a plan. We have to build weapons. We have to have strategy. We have to be able to communicate. We have to build traps. And then we can go hunting. Because just as an individual naked, without weapons, without tools, we're pathetic. So we've always done this. But what was discovered in the beginning of the 18th century is how efficacious, how competent our reason really is. What do we call the period of the 18th century? Historically, what is it called? The Enlightenment. What's another age or another name for the Enlightenment? The age of? Renaissance. No, Renaissance was before. 
the age of reason. So the Enlightenment is an era of the discovery or rediscovery of the efficacy of human reason, a capacity to think. And how do we discover this? Well, it's also called the age of science. Newton, anybody know Newton? He is the first, if you will, Enlightenment thinker. And what Newton does is he teaches us about the physical reality, laws of motion, gravity. He explains to us the world in simple terms. Mathematical, but simple. We can actually understand how the world works. Now remember, people up until this point, truth came from where? How did they know what was true? Where did they assume truth came from? What explained the world to them before Newton? Religion, God. A book, an ancient book, written a long, long time ago that said, for example, that the sun goes around the earth. And then scientists came and said, book is wrong. Some of them got burnt at the stake. Let's party. What's that? Let's party. I'm, let's party. Like, somebody who told us it's not party. Yeah. You can't disagree with the book for a long time. And where does truth come from? It comes from God. But how do we know what God thinks? Right? We need some intermediary, like a pope, who talks to God and then tells us what the truth is. So we as individuals, up until the 18th century, believed that we did not have access to the truth. And then these scientists come around and they tell us, no, 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 no. Each one of you has the capacity to reason. Each one of you has eyes. Each one of you has a brain. Each one of you can understand the physical world around you. Look, here, let me show you. Let me give you the equations. Let me teach you. And Newton's laws are not that hard. And to understand Newtonian physics is not that complicated. If you don't know it, it's because you had a bad teacher. Or have a bad teacher. But they're not that hard. And Newton and his, and his friends used to go all over Europe and they used to travel and give seminars on the physics and used to do demonstrations and show people, look, it's all understandable. You don't need a book. You don't need somebody to commune with the world of spirits. The world is right here and it is understandable to you, each one of you. And suddenly people woke up and they said, wait a minute, if I have reason... If I can understand the physical world, then why can't I decide what profession I want to go into? I, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a, I don't know, a bookkeeper or, or a, a laborer or a farmer or whatever. I want to do what I want to do. I want to choose. I have my reason. I have the ability to think for myself. And they said, wait a minute, if I can reason, if I can think for myself, why, why can't I choose who to marry? Because nobody got to choose in those days who to marry. And if I can think for myself, why can't I choose my political leaders? And if I can think for myself, why isn't my life the standard? Why isn't my life an end in itself? Why must I be sacrificed to the king, to the council, to the tribe, to God? So Western civilization is really two ideas that come out of this period of time. The main idea of Western civilization is the efficacy of reason, reason as a means of survival, and reason as accessible to each one of us as individuals. That what makes us unique as a species is our capacity to think, capacity to reason. And because it is reason, because reason is an individual characteristic, there is no, there's no floating consciousness above here. There's no collective reason. There's no collective mind. Just like you cannot eat for me, I can only eat for myself. You can't think for me. You can't discover truth for me. I have to discover it. I have to think. I have a mind. It's not your mind. It's mine. So the second concept is the idea of the individual and the importance of the individual. 
and the sanctity of the individual. So you get reason, individual's reason, individuals are important, and then you get to the Declaration of Independence, the American Declaration of Independence, that says, for the first time in human history, in my view is, the Declaration of Independence is the most important political document in all of human history. Because it articulates universal truths, and it is what Western civilization becomes comes from that document. It impacts it. all of Europe and today, I think, the entire world. Because it says, it identifies the idea that your life belongs to whom? Who does your life belong to? You. Not to God. Not to other people. Not to a king. Not to a tribe. Not to a group. But to you. Your life is yours. And as a consequence, you have an inalienable right. What does an inalienable right mean? What do rights mean? What, is a, what does a right mean? Rights are, are words we use, but what does it actually mean? Freedom to do anything. You have freedom to act. Rights means freedoms of action. Rights mean freedom of action. So you're free to act for what? You have a right to your... Life, which is really the only right, because everything else is a derivative of your life. But you have a right to your life, which means you have a right to pursue the values that you need, that you think you need, in order to thrive as a human being, as an independent, individual human being. And it's inalienable means nobody can take it away. Not a majority, not a dictator, nobody. You, as a human being, have this right because you're a human being. Because it's part of your nature. So you have a right to life, you have a right to pursue the values necessary for your life, and you have a right to think, right to liberty. Life, liberty. You have a right to think and write and speak and express yourself in any way that you choose. Nobody, not a majority, not a king, not a prime minister, not a president, has a right to take that and to limit that and to constrain what you can say, what you can think, what you can express. And, and this is a true revolution, you have a right to pursue your own happiness. Which means you're not just a cog in a machine to make the world a better place for some other group. You're not essentially Georgian and you're just there to make Georgia a better place. Or America. Or any. You're not part of a group. Your moral purpose in life is you. Your life. Your happiness. Your success as an individual. So you have the tool to think for yourself and you have a moral responsibility to yourself to think for yourself. To think what the values should be that you should pursue and politically what we must do is leave you free to pursue those values. And what does freedom mean? Because like I said before, if I went in front of a group of communists and I asked them, are you for freedom? Every hand would go up. And I went in front of a group of fascists and ask them, are you for freedom? Every hand would go up. Because nobody defines the word. What do they actually mean by freedom? They mean something very different than we do. What do we mean by freedom? Well, I mean by freedom. I don't know what you mean. What is freedom? The pursuit of your happiness. What's that? The, less, uh, the pursuit of your own happiness. Yeah. But, but what is that? Free of what? What does freedom mean? What does that capture? To choose something by yourself. To choose something by yourself without what? Violence. Without somebody else inflicting violence, coercion, authority on you. So freedom is the absence of coercion. It is that environment where we as individuals can pursue our own values, our own life, our own thinking, free of coercion. Now this... These ideas, 
reason and individualism and a political system that leaves us free to pursue those. That is what the West is. That's what is meant by Western civilization. Every idea that counters that, in my view, is anti-Western. Communism is anti-Western. Nazism, fascism are anti-Western. In a sense, religion that tells you your life is not yours, that you shouldn't think for yourself, that you don't have the capacity, the truth is not from reason, is anti-Western. And these Western ideas are not Western because of a geography. They're Western because they happen to develop in a particular place. But anybody, anywhere in the world can adopt them. And when they do, when they do, they are successful. It doesn't matter what culture, what ethnic group, what geography, what color skin, or any of those things. Human beings are human beings. And if they adopt these ideas, they succeed. So when I talk about Western civilization, I talk about these two fundamental ideas. Reason and individualism and the political system that makes them possible, which is basically capitalism, freedom. And these ideas are under assault today. They're under assault from almost every direction. We're told in America in particular, but I think this is going out there into, I see it, I see it all over Europe now, but it, it, it kind of started, this, this modern manifestation started in America. We're told we're not really individuals, for example. You're just a member of a group. And your group is defined by what? What defines your group? It's called identity politics in America. Your group is defined by your gender. Women are different than men. They have different logic, they have different way of thinking, and they've been oppressed for so long that it's changed the way they are. We're told. And then you're defined by your gender, and of course, we don't just have two genders anymore. Now we suppose you have 99 genders, or 98, or whatever the number is lately. And each one of those is a group that has its own identity, that functions as a group that's not a group of individuals, but a group that is monolithic in some sense. And it's not just gender, of course. It's color of the skin. It's ethnic background. It's whatever they come up with lately. It's hard to keep track. Religion. Religion. So what defines you as an individual, according to these new theories, is your group membership. And groups should be treated differently Based on what? Based on how, they, how needy they are and how oppressed they've been in the past. And the more oppressed they've been in the past, the higher they are in the hierarchy. And the more oppressive they've been in the past, the lower they are in the hierarchy. So the assumption is individuals don't matter. We as individuals don't matter. We should not care about individuals. What we should only care is about groups. Tribes. We're going backwards to tribal mentality. And underlying this is the idea that we don't know truth. That in some sense there is no truth. What's true for you is not true for me. That the world, reality, everything, truth is in flux. There is nothing absolute. That reality is not observable, is not knowable through reason. Philosophically, this great achievement of the enlightenment of figuring out that we as individuals have the capacity to know the world was immediately undercut by philosophers in the 19th century. No, you don't know the world. The world is in another dimension, which what ancient philosopher said, truth is in another dimension. We can know the truth. Oh, we need philosopher kings to tell us what the truth is. Who said that? Uh, yeah, Plato, so Socrates and Plato. Plato taught us that the truth is in another world. What we see here is just shadows. It's not real. We can't tell anything. 
Therefore, we need philosopher kings, dictators, authoritarians, popes, to commune with the world of spirits and to tell us what the truth is. The Enlightenment says no, but now we go backwards. We can't tell what the truth is as individuals. We don't know what reality is as individuals. We can't rely on our senses. We can't rely on our minds. And indeed, what's more important than thinking? In America, they teach this from when we're very little. What's more important than thinking? What makes us human, we're told today? It's our emotions. It's our feelings. Can't be upset. We can't offend anybody. You can't challenge anybody. We call American, this is your age, we call them snowflakes. Why snowflakes? Because they're so delicate. They're so sensitive. And each, if you know each snowflake is unique, no two snowflakes are alike, so you're all so unique, which is true, but you're so delicate that if we just, if we just express an idea that might offend you, you melt completely. That it were the same? Yeah, yeah well. Sorry. <laughs> well, human beings, we have so much DNA that can guarantee that none of us exactly is the same. And if we, even if we had the same DNA, given that we have free will, we'd express it differently. So therefore, we would still be two. So if you take identical twins, they're not the same. Yeah, if they live together. If they're even if they live together, they're not the same. Because what determines us? You got your DNA. That one, one, one theory in psychology says... Evolutionary psychology says we're just determined by our DNA, right? And what's another theory that says we're just determined by what? Society. Society, by environment, by our parents, Social. by the way we grow up and everything. And then there's some radical, radical psychologist that says, no, 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 it's both. It's a little bit of both. And I say they're all wrong. Because what's missing? DNA environment. What's missing? Yeah, you. You're missing. I'm missing. Free will. The choices you make. The choices you make from when you're very young. What's that? Yeah, it's missing my mind. Yeah, your mind. And your choice to use it or not. Which is the fundamental choice that we all make as human beings. To use our mind or not. So they might, our free will, our, our, our willingness to engage our free will or not might be affected by certain things, but it's still there. Yeah. And I view, in my view, it's the most important factor that determines who you are. Not society, not your genes, you. What you do with your mind is what will ultimately determine who you become. Of course we can. It's a cop-out otherwise, right? Forget about society. Think about what you choose to do with your life. Society is, a, is an abstraction and much later, much more important is that you decide how you want to live, what kind of life you as an individual want to have. But today, our free will is under attack. Everybody knows Sam Harris? Yeah, I mean, Sam Harris and many intellectuals are claiming we have no free will. Our reason is under attack. Postmodernism tells us there is no reality out there and we ha have no idea how to engage with that reality, how to know that reality. And the modern kind of identitarians on the right and on the left are telling us we're just a product of our race. Racists on the left and racists on the right. That you as an individual don't matter. Your membership in a group is all that matters. In other words, today, Western civilization is under attack in all areas. And of course, all of these lead to what conclusion in politics? If you do not have free will, if you cannot access the truth, and if you're just a member of a group and mean nothing as an individual. Yeah, so it causes apathy on the part of the individual. It causes impotence, because if I can't think, what's the point in anything? 
And it brings us back to an era of human society before the Enlightenment, where we lived as tribes, where we cared only about people who looked like us, where our lives did not belong to us. It's a return to a pre-enlightenment period. It's a return to poverty. And politically, it's a return to what? Authoritarianism. If you can't discover the truth, then you have to find a, a political leader or a group that can somehow reflect that truth. If your reason is impotent, if you cannot think, then how, what are you going to do? What, what emotion, what emotion do you think we get if, if we discover that our minds don't work? Fear. Fear. Yeah, we become afraid. And if we're afraid and don't believe in our own mind, what do we look for? What do we search? Security. Security. And where do we find the security? In a group. In a group. In a group with other people who look like us. Again, the racism. We look, if they look like us, then I feel safe. And then, but how does this group make decisions? Because you still have to live, you still have to make decisions, and the groups can't make decisions, right? Collectivists, but, but who makes the decision? Somebody has to make a decision for us. The government. And the government isn't a free government because we're too incompetent to, make, to choose. We need a leader. And that leader has to make decisions for us. So the group, which we join because we're afraid, because we've lost trust in our own minds, now has to choose a leader. And usually we don't choose them, it just arises. Who now can exploit the group but who can tell us what is true and what is not. And every collectivistic worldview, every collectivistic vision has to have a leader. I mean, think about communism, right? I don't know if you've read Marx, but Marx has this utopia in the future. And the utopia in the future, there are no leaders. We all just are in paradise. Our material well-being is all guaranteed. It's done. It's figured out. So we don't have to worry about food and material stuff. And we can all do our hobbies. We can do fun stuff. We all wander around doing cool things. Right? That's his ideal. But how do we get there? If we get there, we have to gather up as a group, the proletarian. But, but this proletarian, and we have to act in the interest of the proletarian. But how do we know what's the interest of the proletarian? How do we know what's good for the proletarian? What's that? Yeah, we need a leader. We need a philosopher king who can commune with the spirit of the proletarian and let us know what the proletarian needs. I mean, it might need 40 million Ukrainians dying of starvation. I mean, that's what the proletarian needs, right? What did Lenin say? You have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, which means you have to kill a few people to get a perfect society. But it doesn't matter in a collectivistic mind because individuals don't matter. The only thing that matters is the group. And if the group requires some to die for the sake of the group, who cares? That's OK. But it's, again, the philosopher king. We need that leader. The Nazis, right? We're going to do this for the Aryan race. Well, who knows what the Aryan race needs? Who knows what the Aryan race wants? Well, Hitler does. He communes with the Aryan race. He has this vision of what's good for the Aryan and he dictates, and he's a dictator. Collectivism always leads to authoritarianism. Denying individual reason always leads to collectivism. So are you agreeing that democracy is, uh, causes uh, authoritarianism? So what's democracy? Um, decision that is made by people. Uh, How many people? All right, I don't agree with, what's that? All the people? So, so take the first democracy. First democracy, I, and, and I, you know, pure democracy. We're talking about pure democracy. The first democracy was in Athens, in Greece. And there was this philosopher, we mentioned him earlier, Socrates. And Socrates was walking around town and he was challenging young people about their religion. He was, and he was offending the religious authorities. And they were worried. 
because he was corrupting the youth, corrupting minds. you, their minds. So what did they decide to do? Make yeah, and how did they make the decision? Uh, by, by, majority. by majority vote, by democracy, Athenian democracy, killed Socrates, and, but a majority of people wanted it. So it must be good, because democracy is always good. No. Since when do democ since when do majorities know what's true? Since when do majorities know what's right? Since when does the did, 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 did a majority discover Newton's laws? Did a majority decide what it, can a majority decide what's right and what is wrong? I'm saying that you shouldn't trust democracy. But what is democracy? And I'm saying, I'd say more than that. I'd say that the founding of America, which I think is symbolic of what the West is, was not democratic. Democracy is the idea that we get to choose everything. But then I'm giving you the power over my life. What if you decide that I should do something I don't want to do? Then what about my right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Democracy is in contradiction, is in conflict with the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Because the right says, I have the freedom to act in pursuit of my values, in pursuit of my happiness. It doesn't say, if the majority allows. Rights are absolute. So, democracy, which in the modern world today has become a god, has become the thing. Democracy is incompatible, pure democracy, is incompatible with freedom. So what you need is a method, a system of government that protects freedom. That yes, maybe we could vote for who is at the head of that system of government, but they have no power over your lives. The only job a proper government's only job, only job, should be to do what? To protect your rights. To create a world where you can pursue your values free of coercion, free of interference, free of authority, including the authority of the government. So the purpose of government is only one. That is to secure your freedom, to secure your rights, not to intervene, not to tell you what's good for you. Not to tell you who to live for. Not to tell you who to help. Not to tell you what businesses to open or not to open. Not to tell you how much to pay your employees. But to leave you free to make choices for yourself based on your own mind, based on your own reason. Well, what you do if the government is not doing that? Then you get rid of them. You have to, and to get rid of them, you have to first educate. You have to first believe in something. You have to know what you're fighting for. Because it's easy to fight against. But what are we fighting for? Uh, but if we have a full freedom, we won't have equality. If we have full freedom, we won't have equality. That's right. Who the hell wants equality? So what's more important? No, what's more important? Uh, I, I think that uh, we are individuals equally. So what does equality mean? What do we mean by equality? Equality and freedom. So equality of outcome? Equality of wealth? Opportunities. Equality of opportunity, so we're all going to have exactly the same opportunities? Equality. Now think about this. Ideals should be realistic. They should be doable in reality. Otherwise, they're just floating. Is the equality of opportunity possible? No. no. Is equality of outcome possible? No. Let me, let me tell you a story. So there was this, uh, there was a group of intellectuals who studied in Paris, good universities, Sorbonne, places like that, with the best philosophers. And they decided they wanted equality. They were going to fight for equality. And they went back to their country. They went, they went back to their country, and they managed to get political power. And they said, we're going we're gonna to establish a society for the first time of equality. But there was a problem. Some people lived in the countryside. 
And some people lived in this big city. What are we going to do? The people in the city have huge advantages over the people in the countryside. How do we make them equal? How do we make them equal? No, you can't. Kick them out of the city. So they literally drove everybody out of the city, million, millions of people out of the city into the countryside. But now, where do you find food? And some people are good at producing food, and some people are not so good at producing food. So what do you do then? Because some people are foraging. You know what foraging is? It's like going out and picking nuts and berries. Some people are really good at it. Some people are not. So they ban foraging. So now people are starving. But even under these conditions, where everybody's in the countryside, almost everybody's starving, they're not equal. Because some people can read. Some people went to university. Some people went to high school. Some people have glasses, some people don't. What are we going to do? How are we going to establish equality? How do you make it equal between people with education and lack of education? And look, these people don't have time. We need to establish equality quickly. We're not going to wait generations until equality happens. We need to make it happen today. So how do you do it? What's that? Well, this is all through the government. How do you do it? Through the government. How do you do it? What's that? Oh, no, you can. No, I can't. How do you do it? Killing them. You kill them. You kill them. But the people who remain, right? Yeah, I, mean, I, I know you can't, but, you know, play along, right? <laughs> they literally, anybody who wore glasses was shot. Anybody who had an education was shot. Anybody who exhibited any unique skills was shot. Why do we have to have a name? They killed two million people of their own people out of seven million. Which country are you thinking about? Anybody know? Cambodia. Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge. You can look this up, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, all educated in Paris, all with great ideas about equality, and all motivated by a utopian society where we're all equal. They killed over 40% of their own population. That's what equality will get you. So what kind of equality can we achieve? What kind of equality should we achieve? What kind of equality means something that doesn't involve killing people? Equality of rights. Yeah, equality of rights. We're all free to pursue our lives. But you know what? Some of us are going to make a lot of money and some of us won't. Who cares? Some of us chose to be teachers. We're pretty smart. We could have gone and been bankers, done something else, but we chose to be poor. Because teaching never pays a lot of money. Certainly not as much as banking. But you make choices in life. So what? Life's about money. It's not about money. Life's about choices. Life's about living. Life's about experiencing. Life's about pursuing your values. And if your values are not monetary, then you won't pursue monetary values. So what? So the only equality that matters is equality of rights, equalities of liberty, equalities of freedom. We're all equally free. We all, each one of us as an individual has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I don't have a right, even if I get a lot of people to vote with me, to take your rights away to constrain you, to limit you. You have a right to do what you want. And if that involves making billions of dollars, why would I stop you? Why is it any of my business? On the contrary, I love billionaires. I think billionaires are cool. I use their products. I'm not talking about in Georgia, I know. I'm talking about real billionaires who actually produce stuff to get their billions, right? I don't know how you're billionaires. I'm not talking about oligarchs. I'm talking about real billionaires in a marketplace that make money by producing stuff that we all consume, right? Like, like uh, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, who actually we've all benefited from. Jeff Bezos, I can't live without Amazon. I don't know how I ever lived without Amazon. He's changed my life. He's made my life hugely better. If I ever met Jeff Bezos, the first thing I'd say to him is, thank you. 
because the value, the utility he's provided in my life far exceeds the money I've, I've given to Amazon, you know, in exchange for goods. So the real battle for Western civilization is a battle about your right as an individual to think and act on your own behalf. And that doesn't require democracy, that requires freedom. And some democratic systems are unfree because the majority imposes itself on minorities. And what's the smallest minority? The individual. The only significant minority is the individual. We shouldn't define minorities by color of skin or by gender or by sexual orientation or anything like that. We should define a minority by the fact that the individual is the smallest minority. And what we should defend is minority rights, which means individual rights. Our right as individuals to live our life as we see fit. Free of force, free of coercion, free of an authority that tells us what the truth is, that tells us how to live our lives, that tells us what our values should be. No, we get to choose as individuals what those should be. And we get to live our lives as we see fit. That's what Western civilization is about. That's what's under threat. And that's worth fighting for. Fighting for your right to live your life as you see fit based on your reason, based on your mind. So fight. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Now we're able to ask questions. Uh, I have my own question. Okay. How, how Immanuel Kant is connected to that? You know that Immanuel Kant is uh, like, the very person who is very connected to life. Yes. Like, and how then his ideas are connected to life? And what is contradiction between their ideas? Yeah. So Immanuel Kant was a late 18th century philosopher from Germany. And he was the first anti-enlightenment philosopher. I mean, him and Rousseau about the same time, but they're both anti-enlightenment. And they really, their goal is, their goal is to undermine the enlightenment. In the Critique of Pure Reason, um, Kant says that he's writing the book in order to save faith from reason to save faith from reason. And what Kant does is he does, I mean he does a lot of things, but two big things, right? The first thing is, he says, you think you're observing the world, but you're not. What you're observing is what your senses in your mind have configured of the world, but the world is in a different dimension, you don't know what it is. Echoing Plato, right? You live in a cave. So Kant says we don't know what reality really is. We just, our senses shape our understanding of reality. It distorts our understanding of reality. So the real reality out there is unknowable to us. So science, logic, reason is just a game inside our heads and has no real relevance to real reality. So it divorces reason from fact, from reality itself. Reason becomes a game inside our heads. So that's in epistemology, the theory of knowledge. The other part of it is he says, you can't know what is right and what is wrong, what is, what is moral or not, based on reason. The only way to know what's moral or not is to follow what he calls categorical imperatives, commandments in secular terms. Now where do you find these commandments? Now he's trying to do this secularly, even though he's very religious. He's trying to do it without God. So he says, no, no, you, the commandments are in your consciousness somehow. The category, but we all know what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. And what is good? Good is to live for other people. Good is to assist other people. And you must do so out of a sense of duty, of obligation. If when you're helping the poor, for example, you think, oh, I'm going to enjoy this. This is going to be fun. Like some people in charity. You know, I'm going to help people. It's going to make me feel better. That's not moral. Because you thought about yourself. The essence of morality for Kant is selflessness. No self. No individual. 
no you. Now, how does that, and he, and he says, he even says in a passage, he says, if you meet somebody happy, who's happy, right? Be suspicious. Why? Because if they're happy, they probably pursued their own self-interest somewhere along the line. Because how do you become happy if you don't try to be happy, if you don't pursue self-interest? So don't trust them because they're probably immoral. Now, remember, the enlightenment is about what? It's about using your reason that discovers truth, not just what it feels, the real truth, in order to pursue your own life and your own happiness. The enlightenment, Western civilization, is about self-interest. It's about you taking control over your own life, your own mind, and pursuing your own values for the sake of your own happiness. And Kant says, no. Kant says, you must sacrifice. Kant says, you must live for others. Kant says, you must always be selfless if you're going to be moral. And I think in his epistemology and in his ethics, he basically undercuts the Enlightenment. He challenges it. And all the thinkers after him are anti-Enlightenment. Hegel tells us contradictions are part of the world. There's contradictions. Embrace them. Relish in them, right? The opposite of his Statilian logic, which says, no, no, no. There can't be contradictions. A is A. It can be A and non-A at the same time. Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx, who then completely throws out individualism, right? And all the way to Nietzsche, who throws out morality. All of them are anti-enlightenment figures. All of them are anti-freedom, anti-individual. So even if in their politics, even if Kant says some good things in his politics, and in his economics, it doesn't matter because his philosophy, his underlying ideas are fundamentally anti-freedom, fundamentally anti-individualism, anti-the individual and anti our capacity to reason. So he undercuts himself, even if he says some good things in, in politics. And that's true of all the rest of the thinkers. The whole line of German thinkers post-Kant is anti-enlightenment, anti-individualism, and anti-freedom. And that's what influences the world today. They're all, they're all uh, um, descendants of Immanuel Kant. And Rousseau. Rousseau is the other one. All about emotion. Anti-reason. Any questions about anything? Oh, yep. Uh, I, I want to know about free will. Uh, you said there are people who said that free will uh, don't, don't need to exist. Uh, and maybe they ask uh, freedom means uh, free from something or someone. Yes? Uh, and uh, our will, from, uh, from what is free? Our will. It's free from external, external influence, external cause. So our will is caused by itself. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a first cause. And it, it, it's free from, uh, from society. And it, in a sense, it's free from society. But so free will really, according to Rand, free will at its core is the choice to think or not to think, to engage your mind or not to engage your mind. And that doesn't have a cause external to itself. That choice is its own cause. So it's not determined by other causes external to it. That's what it means. You get to wake up in the morning and either turn it on or not. And you know, some mornings you don't want to get out of bed, you don't want to turn it on, you don't want to focus, you don't want to look around, you don't want to actually engage. You don't want to think. And if it's once in a while, who cares? But if you do that every day, you screw up your life. But that's a choice you make. And you can even feel it sometimes. You go, uh, no, no, I need to focus. And that, no, no, I need to focus. That's the act of free will. Everything else is a subsidiary of that first choice that you make. To focus or not to focus. And many people, many people go out throughout the day in half focus. Enough focus not to get run over by a car, but not engaging their mind in thinking, in observing, in choosing, in, in, in setting values, in evaluating, in really using their reason. And what Rand encourages us to do is use the tool, 
Use your mind. Constantly stay engaged with the world. Choose, evaluate, judge. Think, think, think. For Ren, the most important thing you can do in your life is to think. And then act on those thoughts, but to think. Because that, there's nothing else. Other questions? What do I think about political correctness? Yeah, it's like, uh, I think, kind of make some people against Western world and so on. Like, yeah, I mean, political correctness is what I was talking about before. It's an it's a attempt to limit our thinking. It's an attempt to limit our expression. It's an attempt to tell us what, is, what we can and cannot say, what we can and cannot think, what we can and cannot do. All in the name of... Somebody is being offended. Somebody doesn't like it. Somebody feels bad. Now, there's an element of truth to political correctness, right? There's no reason to offend people for no reason. There's no reason to be just vulgar and rude, right, when you interact with other people. But they've taken that basic idea of just civility, of just being a decent human being. And now they say, no, no, you're evil or you're bad. If you say something that might offend other people, well, how do I know it's going to offend other people? Well, you have to be very, very careful. And here's some words you can't say. And here's some ideas you can't think. And on and on and on, right? So it's an attempt to control our thinking. In the name of, oh, no, we're just trying to be, you know, polite and civil. So now, you know, in America, comedians have to be careful what they say. So there's certain jokes you can't make. And a lot of universities won't, in, universities won't invite certain comedians to, to the university because they say offen offensive things. Now, almost anything you say is offensive. If you make a joke about women, it's offensive to women. If you make a joke about men, well, it's never offensive to men if they're white because they're the oppressors. Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole hierarchy now of oppression, white men at the top, and, I, you know, and then you can, you can you know, you can score yourself on, on uh, how many oppression points you get, right? <laughs> if, you're, if you're straight, that is not a homosexual or not trans or anything, and you're white and you're male, you're at the top. Now, I, I find all of that, all of that way of thinking disgusting, right? If I look at my skin, it's white, but I don't consider myself white. It's meaningless. And if you look at your genes, it's super gene meaningless because we're all kind of mutts. So I don't look at myself as white, as unique. I mean, male is important because it has a function, right? But the, the color of my skin is irrelevant. It's stupid. But that's what everybody's focused on these days, both on the, radic on the crazy right and on the crazy left. And yes, some people have been oppressed. Blacks, to some extent women homosexuals, others. And that's bad. So stop oppressing them. Let's stop oppressing them and treat them like individuals. Great. Problem solved. Move on. But they obsess about this. And that's wrong. Yeah. What do you think? Who is John Galt? Uh, is he the most important symbol of freedom? So is John Galt, for those of you who've read Atlas Shrugged and those of you who haven't, you should, is he the most important symbol of freedom? I mean, I think he is. I think so. Um, I think he is, because what is, who is John Galt? John Galt is the thinker. John Galt is the independent individual thinker who lives for whom? Himself. For himself. And that's, that's what you need for liberty. That's what you need for freedom. Not a member of a group, not a emoter, not a person of faith, but to have freedom, to have liberty, what you need is an individual who thinks for himself and pursues his own happiness, lives for himself, and Galt has, a, has an oath in the book, there's an oath, and say, uh, you know, I swear by my life that I will live for no other man and ask no other man to live for me. 
So you don't sacrifice to other people, but you don't expect other people to sacrifice. You don't demand that they sacrifice to you. You don't want them to sacrifice to you. You live for yourself using your mind under a political system that is free. But think about it this way. If I'm a collectivist, if I believe I'm determined by my group and what's important is my group identity and what's important is what my friends think and what other people think, then what kind of government do I want? I want a government that tells me what to do because I don't know what to do. I need to figure out what my friends want. I need to figure out what other people, what my group wants. I need somebody to tell me what the group thinks is a good thing for me to do. So collectivists, people who are individually collectivistic, that is, they look to other people for their identity. They look for other people for the truth. They look for other people for sympathy. Everything is about other people. They want strong, powerful governments. But think about an individual who says, no, I've got a mind. I can think for myself. I want to choose my own values. I want to choose my own life. I want to decide how to live my life. I have this capacity to reason, and I want to use it. What kind of government does an individualist like that want? What's that? Yeah, he wants to be left alone. Don't put mother government on my shoulder telling me what I can eat, what I can drink, what I can smoke, what I can, what I can do with my life. I get to choose. I might make mistakes. I know I'm going to make mistakes. But it's my responsibility to make them, to learn from them, to improve myself, to make myself a better life. I don't want other people, through a government, forcing me to do things I don't want to do. So in order to have a world of liberty, in order to have a society that respects liberty, first you have to have a world of individuals who respect themselves, who respect their own life, who respect their own mind, who respect their own thinking, their own values. Yeah, you want to fight for your own happiness. So I always say when people talk about politics, the first step in politics is education. You're not going to change the world. You're not going to wake up a freer world unless you have individuals who are independent, who want to fight for their own happiness, for their own success, for their own values. Then they'll demand political freedom. But if people are collectivists, then what we're going to get is a disaster, no matter what they, words they say. Even if they say they're for liberty and freedom, it's not going to manifest. They might say they're for liberty and freedom because all their friends say it's, they're for liberty and freedom. So they're just following the group. But then the government, the politics, will still be driven by, coll by collectivism. So you need, for individualist government, you need an individualist society. An individualist society we can only make by each one of us living an individualistic life and advocating for an individualistic life. That's fine. So, <laughs> look, children are children, right? Again, because of the way human beings evolved, we have this capacity to reason and a mind that has to grow. It has to achieve a certain just size in order to be able to actually deal with the complexities of the world. Children cannot deal with those complexities. Metaphysically, biologically, physically, they, they can't walk initially, right? They can't crawl initially. Never mind think. They can't communicate. They don't have concepts. They can't really abstract. So biologically, they are incapable of doing those things. And as a consequence, 
somebody has to protect their ability to grow up, to be an individual, to think for themselves, and so on. And that's the job of the parents. Not of the government, but parents. Parents, in a sense, well, parents, by having the kids, take on the responsibility of guiding them through life so that they can become adults, so that they can stop being dependent, right? But that's biological. But once you're an adult, there's no biological thing preventing you from choosing your own values, making the choices necessary for your own life. And nobody has a right to use force against you. The only reason we use force against children is because they truly don't have the capacity. And even then, you should limit the amount of force you use with children. Yeah, you stop them from walking in the street, but you don't beat them up just because they're children, right? You do what is necessary to preserve their life so that they can develop the skills and the capabilities to become adults. But the only reason to be a child is to be what? Is to be an adult. Everybody thinks being a child is fun. No, it's much more fun being an adult. Because you actually have your full capabilities with you. So no, you can't compare the two. The whole point of being an adult is you are you. And you get to make the choices at that point. Because you have the full capabilities. Now what if somebody is mentally retarded? Never, never has the reasoning capacity more than a five-year-old. Then somebody has to take care of them. And somebody, in a sense, does use force against them. But if you're a normal adult who has the mental capacity to take care of themselves, why would anybody intervene? Children, again, are different, biologically different. They're not fully human in that sense. They're not, certainly not adults. Any other questions on anything? Politics, Georgian politics. No. Oh, can I ask one more? Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll go there and then we'll come back. Uh, you have mentioned the snowflake generation, right? The, the snowflake uh, generation. The people that are easily damaged and vulnerable. Yep. Uh, one of the universities in America banned the clapping during the lecture. Like it would, uh, they thought that it would become uh, kind of a barrier or like anxiety for the uh, for the students. Yeah. What do you think about these kind of practices and how can it coexist with the free society when we want to like express ourselves even by clapping? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, I, I can understand banning clapping if it's disruptive or if it interferes with the flow of a lecture or if it's something like that. But to ban clapping because it creates anxiety? Like, get a life. Yeah. Get a psychologist. I don't know. Go to therapy. I, I mean, anxiety is part of life. Anxiety is part of life. Anxiety is, a, is an evolutionary, if you will, tool to tell us something's wrong and we need to take care of it. And we need to deal with it. So deal with it. And if you get anxious because of clapping, then you've got problems that you should have to deal with. So I think what's happened in America, and I, I, I doubt it's happened in Georgia, but in America it's happened, is the American educational system doesn't focus anymore, and we're talking about from when they're very young, doesn't focus anymore on facts and thinking. That's old fashioned, thinking and facts. What does it focus on? On emotion, on how the kids feel, on socialization, on making sure we get along together. And this is all, again, philosophy shapes everything. Ideas shape everything. So this is the philosophy of John Dewey. John Dewey was an American philosopher, a pragmatic, pragmatic philosopher, and he was the most um, influential uh, philosopher of education. And his view was schools are not for teaching you facts and logic. Schools are for socialization and for teaching you how to express and feel your emotions. Now, I'm not against emotions. Emotions are great. As you can tell, I'm pretty passionate, right? Emotions are how we experience life. You want to have strong emotions because that's how we experience the world. But emotions are not tools of cognition. They don't tell us about the truth other than our own truth in a sense of what's happening inside ourselves. They don't tell me about the world out there. Only my mind can do that. 
Only logic can evaluate, reason can evaluate what's going on. So what we've done is we've elevated emotions above reason. So now if I say something and it causes you a bad emotion, then I have to stop saying it. You know, they have safe spaces where they get to cuddle with teddy bears and listen to soft, pleasant music to calm them down because they got a little emotional. But part of what education should be about is to teach children how to relate to their emotions. Okay, so I'm feeling stressed right now. Why? What's causing the stress? How do I deal with it? How do I put it aside until I finish the lecture and then I'll take care of the stress? Right? I'm not feeling stressed, I'm just using it as an example, right? That's what education should tell us, how to control and ultimately how to understand our emotions so that if they're inappropriate, we can take steps to fix them. And emotions, where do emotions come from? What do we have the emotions that we have? Just <coughs> random. Animal What's that? Animal, animal instincts. We don't have many animal instincts. It's one of the beauties of evolution is it gave us reason instead of instincts. Stimuli. Stimulant. So, um, no matter what the circumstances, I give you the same stimuli to feel the same emotions. Where do emotions come from? Experience. Experience. That it's not just the experience, that's too passive. It's what you conclude about the experience. I just give you a simple, silly example, right? Uh, you're four or five years old, a big dog comes and he's barking at you and you get really afraid. And you come to the conclusion, and maybe this happens three or four times. Conclusion, dog's scary. And then when you're an adult, every time you see a dog, you're kind of scared. And you don't know because you can't remember that they barked at you when you were little. You can't remember the bad experience where you got bitten by a dog. But all you fear is the fear. But the fear is a consequence of an experience you had and a conclusion you came to about the experience. So it's the part of the socialization. It's, in a, it's not socialization because it's the world provides you with experiences, right? Not just other people, like this is a dog providing you with other experiences. And it's not just the experience because some children have a barking dog and they go up to it and they pet it and they have a good time with it and they don't care that it's barking and they never feel they never come to the conclusion, this is the threat, I need to be afraid of dogs. So it's what you conclude about the experience that matters. But this is why we can change our emotions. So you can go to, you can go to therapy and you can relive the experience with the dog and you can say, yes, I understand, I came to that conclusion, it was mistaken, dogs are kind of cute and cuddly and nice and I shouldn't be afraid of them. And the emotion goes away over time. But and we all experience changing emotions, right? You fall in love with somebody, they cheat on you, you don't love them anymore. Why? Because you know more. You get more information, you change your conclusion, and your emotion follows. Now usually, it takes a little bit of time for the emotion to follow. Usually first you decide, oh, they're bad for me, then the emotion slowly follows, because the attachment is strong, and you can, I want to stay with them, but no, they're bad for me. We can ch uh, when we change our conclusions, when we change our ideas, our emotions follow. So it's the role of emotion in life is really crucial to understanding this thing. They put emotion at the top. Emotion as determinant of everything else. Yeah. Uh, my question is about hero as a term. Uh, hero. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what, uh, um, how can you define like, like being a hero means to be uh, selfless or irrational I think being a hero means to be rational and selfish. I mean, which one is the, like, it means to being a selfless? Or no, I don't think it means, I mean, today it means being selfless, but I think that's a bad definition. Yes, that's I think hero is somebody who overcomes great challenges in achieving their goal, their values. It's not about other people. It's about, so I, I, I look at people who, let's say, grew up in awful poverty and, and under really bad conditions, and they make a great life for themselves, right? They achieve. That's heroic to me, right? It's not about jumping on grenades and marching up the hill and winning and flying the flag. 
That's what they, the collectivists want you to think heroism is about. What the collectivists want you to think is heroism is about sacrificing for other people, sacrificing for the group, sacrificing for the nation, being selfless. But I think heroism is about achieving your values. And sometimes those values are capturing the hill, right? Because you're fighting for a good cause, you're fighting for freedom. But it's about your values. And it's about achieving, overcoming fear and achieving and overcoming great obstacles in achieving your values. That to me is heroic. So it's about being selfish, not about being selfless. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a big question and it's a deep question, right? It's not, it's like, what is morality? That's what you're asking. Where does it come from, right? Because that's, what's morality? Morality is the science, the field of study that tells us what good is and what bad is. And most people, what's good and what's bad comes to them from, I don't know, their parents, from society, different societies. You know, for, for the Nazis, good was killing Jews. Right? Um, so for most people, it comes in and they just accept it and they go by what's good and what's bad based on what they've absorbed from society. Uh, for some people, what's good or bad is defined by religion. Commandments, 10 commandments, this is good, these are the vices, this is bad. But I believe you have to use reason to discover what good and bad is. I'll give you an example. So, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, and I encourage you all to read Ayn Rand again, uh, particularly the virtue of selfishness in this regard where she develops an ethical theory, because this is about a theory of morality. It's your job to discover what is good and bad, and each individual must discover it for himself, helped, hopefully, by philosophers, by thinkers, by people who actually develop the principles. But first you have to decide good or bad, for whom? You have to have a standard. And again, conventional morality says, don't think about yourself. Good or bad is about other people. And Ayn Rand says no. The fundamental choices that you have to make are about you. What is good for me? What is bad for me? For my life? For my survival? for my happiness. And then the question is, okay, but are they universal things that are good for all individuals for their life? And Rand would say, yes, absolutely they're universals. We all have certain needs that have to be fulfilled in order for us to be successful in life. So for Rand, what would be, what do you think the most important of those is? What's the, we've talked about this, what's the most important thing that human beings must do in order to be successful in life? Live well, live their life is a tautology, right? You, that's saying the same thing in different words. So what must they do in order to live their life? Use, Use their reason. Think. So for Ayn Rand, for example, the good is to think. Now think about what? Think about how to live a good life, how to survive. So thinking. Now we can't just think, we also have to act, right? Because food doesn't just enter our mouth automatically and wealth doesn't just appear. To get the stuff that we want, that we desire, that is, we believe will make our life better, we need what? Money. We need money, so we need to produce. We need to be productive. So for Rand, let's just take those two. You could go on, but let's take those two. You have to be re you have to use your mind, you have to think, and you have to produce. Now let's take stealing, for example. Why is stealing bad? Why is
Why are you stealing that? Now, if you're a collectivist, if you believe in other, then it's bad because society says so. It's bad because it hurts other people. But it could be good for you, according to that theory, right? Someone can also damage you. Okay, so one reason it's bad for you is because if you engage in stealing, you're legitimizing stealing, and then other people can steal from you. And that's true. But that's not the essential. What's the essential reason why stealing is bad for you? And always think about for you, put aside everybody else, put aside the whole world. Why if you were a thief, would it be bad for you? It would affect your self-esteem. So what does is, what is stealing mean? Stealing, I'm saying to myself, I can't produce. He's produced. This guy who has stuff, he's produced. He's taking care of himself. I can't do it. I have to use muscle, not the mind, muscle, in order to take his stuff for me. No, like you, you can use your mind to steal something as well. <laughs> you can use your mind to steal something. Yes, you can. Like, you can use your mind to steal something. I don't mean, I'm not, I'm going to kill you, you need the money or something like but, this. But this is the, this is the point. Yeah, I mean, I know you can hack into the bank and take the money. I get it. Yes. All of that is force. And all of that is an acknowledgement. Because that's not productive. You haven't created anything. What you've done is you've taken something somebody else has created and taken it. And that taking is an act of force even if it's worth computer programming. But it's not, you didn't make it. You see, money is not just paper stuff, right? It's not just this. It's the work that went into creating this. Now, today, because banks, because uh, central banks just print this stuff, we've lost the connection between this and where it comes from. But this is a reflection of work. If you take my money, you're taking my work. And you are living off of my production. I created something that didn't exist before. That's how I got the money. I didn't redistribute it. I created something. That's the difference. By stealing, you're redistributing from somebody else to you, which is an acknowledgement in your own mind that you cannot create new stuff. So it is a destroyer of your own self-esteem. It's an acknowledgement of your own weakness, an acknowledgement of your own lack of ability to survive in reality, other than by the means of force. It might be, you would call it intellectual force, it's self force. So it undercuts yourself. I'll give you one more example. Why should you be honest? If you're self interested, if you're pursuing your own values, if you're using, if you believe in reason, why should you be honest? What does reason depend on? Trust again, you're talking about other people. Think always about yourself. What does your reason depend on? Support and profit. What's that? Support and profit. Forget, forget profits, forget the world. What does your reason depend on? Facts. Facts. Right? Facts. You need thinking is about things. It's not just thinking, it's about stuff. You need to make sure that what you're thinking about is true if you want the answer to be true. There's a term in computer science. Garbage in, garbage out. If you put garbage into a computer, you'll get garbage. Same with the human mind. You put garbage in, you get garbage out. The human mind is a very delicate machine. If you poison it with non-facts, with lies, it won't function well. So you're crippling your own means of survival. You're crippling your own mind. You're crippling the way in which to achieve happiness. Your mind. Now you say, no, 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 I'm only lying to other people. I'm not lying to myself. But really, once you engage in lying, now you've got a piece of your mind that is engaged in falsehoods. And our mind, the one thing our mind does constantly, our subconscious and when you sleep and it integrates, it connects, makes connections between things. And you can't completely separate the lies from the rest. And if you know people who lie all the time, I know people who lie all the time, half the time they don't know that they're lying because they've lost all connection to reality. Donald Trump is a good example. Half the time he doesn't know he's lying. 
because he doesn't know what reality is. He's lost complete contact with the world out there. So if you value your reason, if you value your mind, if you value your life, you don't lie. Uh, lying is just a stupid strategy for success. If you're in business and you lie, nobody will deal with you. Never mind what you do to yourself. So again, it destroys your self-esteem. It destroys your capacity to think. It's a destructive mechanism. And by the way, at the end of the day, stealing, I didn't address this, but stealing, you get caught. You go to jail. Yeah, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, maybe. But, but even if you didn't get caught, it would still be bad for you. Yes, but maybe I think that society is not stealing, for example, the majority, because they are afraid, they are afraid to go to jail. That's right. So that's true. That today in the world, most people don't steal because they're afraid to go to jail. But that's because we've done a lousy job educating about what they should live for. So in my view, morality, ethics, should be the science that teaches us what are universal values? What is true for all of us and how to live well? In other words, ethics should be the science, an empirical science, about what is good and what is evil. Good is that which enhances life. Evil is that which threatens life, which undercuts life. But it's a hard science, like all sciences. You need experts. So moral philosophers, moral thinkers should be focused on this, which is not what they do. It's, it's, so. People don't know what is good and what is bad. And this is why there's so much education necessary, and this is why I encourage all of you to read Ayn Rand, because I think she's the greatest thinker when it comes to these kind of questions. Aristotle did the same thing. Aristotle's whole ethics is, what leads me to eudaimonia? Eudaimonia being flourishing, success at living. And what leads away from success and flourishing? And he's trying to figure out which value, virtues lead to this and which which behaviors lead to that. And that's what Ayn Rand does, just I think better than Aristotle, because she comes 2,000 years afterwards, so she knows a lot more. But the fundamental idea is what, what can I, what are those things that I should do in order to achieve success in living, in life? So deep question, um, and, and, but it's, it's and, and you're right, most people don't know the answer to it. But that's what we need to teach people. That's what philosophers should be doing. I have a question. Yeah. I think one, one yeah, these two questions and then we're done. Okay. So quick, uh, short ones. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned about democracy and how like, quite often it's a, let's say, failure for us yeah. and we cannot trust it. Uh, however, like Western civilization really depends on it, like the way we view uh, we politics and all the things. So what do you think what terms, uh, could be the alternative to democracy yeah. uh, so that's the system that we can really rely on? So democracy in the West has not been absolute democracy for, f from the beginning. And that's what makes it work to some extent. So for example, we can't execute somebody for trying to corrupt the youth. We have an understanding that free speech cannot be overruled by democracy. I mean, somewhat of an understanding. We, we have hate speech laws in Europe. But we try to constrain those, right? In America, there's a First Amendment. You cannot ban speech. So democracy has been contained by the idea of rights. Not enough, in my view. So the ideal system is the American system, where you have the government's only job is to protect rights, the rights are articulated, and the democracy, the vote, can never violate those rights. And the only problem in America is that, well, there are a number of problems, but one problem in the American Constitution is the rights are not clearly defined enough. They weren't clearly understood enough. So the only voting you do is for who will represent you. But the representatives, the government, should be as impotent and weak as possible, except in one field, which is protection. It should have a police, a military, and a judiciary. It should protect us, protect our rights, and leave us alone. And that's what should be defined in a constitution. 
So you elect people who don't have a big job. So all of us think about politics all the time. We fight about politics, we argue about politics, we think about politics, we read the newspaper for politics. In a good world, in a free world, we wouldn't care because politics wouldn't be in our lives. They defend us, they protect us when there was a threat. But the legislature, you've got a parliament not far from here, right? How often do they meet? All the time. They talk about laws and how to, how to influence your life and how to take money from you and give it to them and regulate your behavior and regulate him and regulate. They're constantly working. A good parliament meets once a year for a short period of time, passes a couple of laws with regard to property rights and goes home. Congress in the U.S. used to meet two or three months every year. And congressmen in the 19th century had jobs. They actually worked for a living. They were politicians on the side. Now, to be a politician is a full-time job with 75 assistants and 55 departments and drivers and security. And, I mean, it's, whoa, it's ridiculous. Politicians should be weak in everything except the one thing that they're supposed to do, which is protect us, nothing else. And then if that, then yes, you have democracy for electing officials, but you don't have democracy for making decisions because the decisions are small and don't happen very frequently. And, you know, they need to be deliberated and they need to think about it and they need to be you know, they need to they need expert opinions about how do you define property rights on the internet or stuff like that, right? So what you want is the constraint. That's what the Bill of Rights does. And you have a constitution that says government can only do these things. You constrain it with the Bill of Rights. Individuals have rights, not the government. The government can't infringe on those rights. So you make the government as limited as possible. And within that limit, you can have democracy in a sense that you vote for your representatives. But they shouldn't be able to vote on taking my money. They shouldn't be able to vote to tell me how to run my business. But that's what minimum wage laws are. That's what regulations are. That's what, uh, you know, welfare state is. It's all people voting to decide how you should live. That's wrong. Yeah, in the back. Change your point of view to what? Uh, I'll say, it. I'll finish. Yeah. Uh, if I want to be individual, uh, if you could have an individual freedom, yeah. I need order to give me uh, uh, like freedom to have this individual freedom, right? So I have to influence other people to uh, think like me, to be to everybody to be individual. So it's kind of a uh, collectivist thing. No. The, the, <laughs> No, so you need order in order to be an to, to pursue to be able to pursue your individual values. But what kind of order do you need? Uh, order makes it sound, you know, that it like I don't know. You need a certain system. The only system you need is a system that protects you, that recognizes your freedoms, that recognizes your rights. That's the order that you need, right? So it's a system that recognizes what you want to do, which is live your life as an individual. That's all it is. So there's no, there's no thing to convince other people other than, this is the one thing you have to convince other people of, that their life is worth living as individuals in pursuit of their own values. And only they can choose those values. Nobody can choose them for them. Once everybody agrees on that, then you're done. Now, 
if you mean it's collectivistic because we all agree, then yes. We all have to have some basic agreement to live in society. If we live by ourselves, then nobody has to agree with you because it's just you. But once we get into society, we have to agree on at least the fact that we can't coerce one another, that we can't use violence against one another. That in order to pursue our individual lives, we must be free to do so. We must be free of authority and violence and coercion and force to do so. That's the only order that you need, in a sense. It's a standard that you need. But it's a standard that says that's the only way we can interact. And we know that. You go to a party, you don't bring a gun. Right? So it, 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 it's, it's basic idea is if you want to have, if you want to get along with other people, if you want to live in a society, you can't use force. Now, unfortunately, we don't believe that because today we use force all the time against individuals in the name of a better society. You know, we tax them, we regulate them, we control them, we take from them, we, we steal from them um, in the name of some societal good. But that's what needs to be eradicated and we need to focus back on an individual and individual sovereignty and individual values. All right, thanks everybody.